paper comes out of this book called Engineering Catastrophes, okay, about why the comet broke up. And it's got a lot more detail, but who knows, well obviously you know something about the comet. Why don't you tell us why, what the comet was? Yep, they could cross the Atlantic. Or was supposed to cross the Atlantic, but it only went about halfway and then crashed into the ocean. Yeah, well, square windows. It's the story of a stress concentration. So, actually, if you look inside this thing that's coming around, this book by Lancaster has got a number of different uh, failure accounts in here. One is the De Havilland Aircraft Company, um, and it gives you a little history of it. Um, in May 1953, from Calcutta to Karachi, broke up in the air during a violent storm. And then they had a number of them over the North Atlantic. Um, uh, but there's a picture, or there's some drawings of the windows, which had a radius, but they were mostly square. And you haven't seen a square window like that on any airplane sets, because you get you got fatigue cracks running right through there, okay? Because um, what was the Howard Hughes movie? I can't remember the, the Aviator, where um, if you've seen the movie, apparently he was someone came to some of his engineers came to him and said, "Well, we can build a pressurized aircraft." the old airplanes in World War I and stuff weren't pressurized and they couldn't fly above the weather. And so whenever you had, you know, a rainstorm or something, people couldn't, go, you know, you couldn't go out. Um, but a pressurized aircraft, you can go up high enough that you'll be over the clouds. And anybody's looked out of your airplane when you're at 30,000 feet, you see the clouds below you. Um, and that's because once you get above about 20,000 feet, the atmospheric pressure is so low that you've got to start putting on oxygen masks and stuff. Uh, otherwise, you get hypoxia. Anybody know what hypoxia is? You no know Navy divers here? Yeah, low oxygen blood content. And um, um, they actually put divers through simulators on Earth, you know, on, on, uh, on the surface and lower the the uh, pressure, and they do this for pilots too, Air Force and other pilots. Um, and I've heard from some of these pilots that uh, when you get hypoxia and you get down to about 16% oxygen in, uh, in the atmosphere, 0.16 atmospheres of oxygen, ordinarily it's 0 0.2, 0 0.21, you're down about um, 0.16 atmospheres, you start to get giddy and happy and they will be sitting there playing cards in this chamber as they're lowering the pressure and they're high-fiving and happy and everything and then they don't let them go this far but then they fall asleep and die okay when you get down to about 0.14 or so so that's hypoxia um, but in any case uh, the, the big thing on the comet was they pressurize it and depressurize it as it goes up every time and it was just a great big pressurized hot dog, right? The fuselage. And that would create stresses, and you have a stress concentration, and they get fatigue cracks. And um, the aluminum back then was not as good as what we have today, and they had problems with exfoliation corrosion, and so you had a sort of stress corrosion cracking and things like that. So does that answer your question? Plus you can read the 10 pages in Engineering cat Catastrophes for more detail. Turns out, uh, as we go through these things and some of the other questions, uh, I thought it was interesting because I have some tie to some of these things. It turns out one of the guys at the British Welding Institute who was brought in to look at these fractures on the comet was Alan Wells, Dr. A.A. A. Wells. 
and he later became director general of the British Welding Institute, and he wrote a letter for my tenure. Hey, except he didn't know beans about me. He said I was very active in the International Institute of Welding. I'd never been to a meeting in my life. <laughs> okay, but that's okay. Okay, I got tenure. So. How do you get tenure? You grovel at other people's feet for six, seven years. Uh, that's a general process. Uh, what do you have to do to get tenure? Uh, MIT has, uh, there's four ranks on, in general, four ranks on the faculty. There's assistant professor without tenure, <coughs> which we abbreviate as AP, and we don't usually say without tenure, but then there's associate professor, which is capital AP, and then we do say either without tenure or with tenure. So, and then there's professor, which always has to have tenure. So what do you have to have at these levels? Here you have to have interviewed well and you know, be in a field that they're interested in pursuing or, or whatever. And so you get hired and then typically, well, the rule is after, if they don't give you tenure, after uh, eight years, uh, you automatically get it, okay? So they spend hours and hours and hours in the upper administration figuring out when people were hired and what their birth date is. There is a, an exception if you're less than 35, okay? And it turns out I was less than 35, um, and so they helped me back a year uh, because they could. Okay, but um, in any case, um, so this is just you get hired in the department and tells the dean this is who we want to hire and the dean approves it, almost a rubber stamp. And then this one, it has to be demonstrated promise. No, that's without tenure. This is the big one. This is the tenure decision right here. Okay? The eight years is if they haven't given you tenure by eight years officially by going through and reviewing you, you would get tenure automatically according to the rules of the faculty. If you're on the faculty for eight years and they never make a decision, the decision is made. Okay? Yeah, but. They don't go eight years. After about six years, they decide it takes a year to go through the whole process of, of promotion. Um, and we, we actually spend lots of time and waste lots of resources. Actually, we don't really waste the resources. It's actually well spent to figure out the quality of, of the faculty. Um, but they spend a lot of time. And so in the sixth year, you will start preparing your case. So the beginning of the seventh year, you will either get it or not get it. And then if they, you don't get it, you got one year to look for another job before the eighth year. And they will give you in the seventh year, if you're not gonna get tenure, they'll give you an appointment for one year, okay? If they gave you an appointment for two years that went beyond eight years, you just got tenure, okay? You get a letter, okay? It is a legally binding letter. And then, so it's, this is, to get this promotion is demonstrated promise. To get this promotion is demonstrated achievement. Okay? And this one is basically world ranking. And when I say world ranking, the School of Science can give you a, a, a professor's ranking to six decimal places because they have formulas and they go by the science citation index and who references your papers and how many papers and what journals they're in. It's bullshit, okay, pure bullshit. Has nothing to do with the intangibles, which you all know are very important, right? I mean, you, ha you go through this same, a similar type of process for your promotions, right? It's not exactly as structured, well, it probably is as structured, but in a different way. Right? 
And so the School of Science, they, they have taken the, the human input out of the whole decision process, where the School of Engineering is still pretty subjective, okay? We spend hours on one person. We typically, in Engineering Council, would spend about an hour discussing a tenure case. So you've got all the department heads and the dean and the dean and associate deans in the School of Engineering. And they'll have 30, 40 promotions a year. So you're talking a person week in the Engineering Council. And then you're talking what, if people are doing their job, which I'm not saying all the department heads do their job, they should have been spending at least as much time reading the cases before they got there, okay? And the case is about a 40-page document, okay, or so, that the candidate puts together. Does that answer your question? How you get tenure? tenure? Uh, but in the School of Engineering, it's dem demonstrated promise, demonstrated achievement, and then you have to be world-renowned. In the School of Eng Science, they like to think that you're one of the top three people in the world in your field. But the nice thing about all this, you can define your field, okay? And it's an important thing for an assistant professor. When I'm sitting there mentoring a young assistant professor, I say, you've got to, you got to have a sound bite. What is your field that you will become known in? Okay, for me, it was welding. Good side of that is it's a very small community. It's not too hard to rise to the top of a very small mountain, okay, and be a, a big fish in a little pond. Um, but if you choose some other field that's sort of wishy-washy and it doesn't have, welding has a society, the American Welding Society. I had to be known in the American Welding Society as one of the top dogs, okay? But once I was known there, you know, there's a community that can talk about you and say good things about you if you haven't in, insulted most of them. One of my problems was uh, I actually did insult most of the people and still do, but nonetheless. Uh, but it turns out when I was... Uh, hired for, or inter being interviewed for the job. I didn't apply for the job. One of the faculty members here who um, was in charge of a search committee, i had been my sophomore advisor. I'd worked in his lab as a sophomore. He thought I was a senior doing a thesis. Anyway, um, he thought I should be a faculty member. And I go to an interview for what I thought was an industrial job, and he was a consultant to this company. TRW was the company. I thought I was interviewing for a job with TRW. I got in the, the room with him for the interview. He says, well, have you ever thought about being a faculty member? I said, why would I want to do that, be an assistant professor and get dumped on? Okay, that's how I felt. He says, no, no, what do you mean? I said, well, take Bob Moravian. Bob Moravian was his, his young grunt assistant professor who had not gotten tenure and was leaving. So what happened to Bob Moravian? after he left MIT. He went to University of Illinois as a full professor. Not a bad job, one of the top five engineering schools in the country. He left there to go to be head of the National Institute of Standards and Technology in Gaithersburg, Maryland, 400 material scientists that he had under him. He left there to become dean at Santa Barbara. He left there to become president of, K of Carnegie Mellon. He left there to become president of Allegheny uh, Industries, and now he's chairman of the board of Allegheny Industries. Okay? But he never got tenure. Anyway, that's another story. We won't tell that story. Okay, other questions? I'm not sure what that had to do with structural materials, but anyway. Uh, but that's what, huh? It's just curiosity, right? Okay, there were, the next set of questions were, why does the U.S. Navy want non-magnetic submarines, and how does fatigue of welds differ from fatigue of homogeneous metals? I kind of rephrased those so I could answer them. But um, why do we want non-magnetic submarines? A magnetic anomaly detection by squids, superconducting quantum interference devices. Do we have my pointer back there? Anyway, <coughs> probably not. Yeah, so S for superconducting, QU for quantum interference device. Um, 
And here is Brian Josephson uh, in the 1960s. He was a 22-year-old graduate student at, uh, I can't remember, I think it's Cambridge. Um, and his, he went to his advisor, new graduate student, and was looking for something to do. The professor was too busy. He gave him the standard physics problem to, to solve. He went to solve it, and he was too stupid to throw out one of the terms. You've learned about solving differential equations and throwing out a term that's irrelevant, right? He didn't know this term was irrelevant. He kept it in, and he was smart enough to solve it with this very difficult term, and he discovered the Josephson effect, which won him the Nobel Prize in 1973, okay? Uh, because he was too stupid to know better, okay? Everyone else who had solved this problem before him threw out the term as being irrelevant. Well, it turns out, and here's Joe Bryan in a later life, if you have a superconductor, which is, superconductors were known since the early 1900s, but if you take one and you put a current in and divide it and have a little insulating film, and I mean angstroms, okay? This has got to be less than 100 angstroms of insulator between two metals superconducting metals, and at the time in liquid helium at 4.2 Kelvin, then you basically will set up an oscillation between these two circuits that will give you different frequencies depending on uh, the Josephson current. And you actually can measure, if you go to Google right now or Wikipedia, 5 times 10 to the minus 18 attoamps, or t 5 times 10 to the minus 18 amps, which is an atto amp. You've heard of micro and mac uh, macro, micro, uh, uh, nano. If you go down to 10 to the minus 18, it's called atto. Okay. How many electrons in an atto amp? Count them on a finger, on a hand. Okay, because there's a 10 to the 18th electron electrons in a coulomb. 10 to the minus 18 times 10 to the 18th is 1, right? So we're talking about actually measuring, actually they call them, it turns out they're pairs of atoms in quantum um, physics. The electrons will pair up as you get down to very low temperatures in the superconducting state. They're called Cooper pairs after uh, Bardeen, Cooper, and Schrieffer who won the Nobel Prize for explaining some superconductivity in the 50s at Bell Labs. Anyway, so they're Cooper pairs of electrons. Two electrons will pair together, and they'll go through here, and they will oscillate. And you can measure <coughs> extremely small magnetic, or magnetic fields. Anybody have an idea of how, if we were talking Gauss, how many Gauss is the Earth's magnetic field, approximately? Half a Gauss. OK. Um, a strong uh, neodymium iron boron magnet might be 10,000 gauss, or what we call one tesla. Physicists, SI units, gauss has become tesla. Uh, anyone ever experienced magnetic arc blow in a shipyard where a guy's welding and the magnetism of the steel causes the arc to blow away from the weld joint where he's putting it? No one's ever seen that? Yeah, well, I wouldn't let you use that close either. Anyway, that's about 50 gauss. When the steel gets magnetized just by the Earth's magnetic field. Okay, just by, well, you ever seen someone take a, a steel rod and pound on it in when it's aligned with the Earth's magnetic field? And when you vibrate it, <coughs> you can get those magnetic domains to to line up and you can magnetize a bar of steel by hitting it with a hammer when it's parallel with the Earth's magnetic field, okay? So in any case, 50 gauss is what the self-magnetization of steel would be that would cause problems with magnetic arc flow and stuff. So you're going to have something in a, magnetic, in a ferromagnetic submarine, you're going to have something that would be a magnetic anomaly if you haven't degaussed, it would be 50 gauss compared to the Earth's magnetic field, which is 100 times less. And even if you degauss it, which you do, degauss submarines, still probably 5 gauss, okay? And it turns out 
with Josephson detectors, you can measure, well, you're not measuring 10 to the minus 18 um, amps or uh, Gauss also has a unit of amps per square meter or something. I can't remember what the conversion is. But in any case, they were projecting even in the 60s when this was invented that they would be able to put detectors up in space 100 miles above the ocean and see the magnetic anomalies in the ocean. Now, in fact, I'm not sure if they've ever gotten there. They probably have by now. In the 70s, when I was working on superconductivity, they could fly an airplane over with a magnetic detector and they could see through the, through the water and see the magnetic uh, anomalies. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So they can see, see the uh, signature, uh, magnetic signature, and they, I suspect they could probably do this, particularly with now they don't have to have liquid helium up in space. They can have high temperature superconductors, which is the next slide. This is a Josephson junction. By the way, when I met John Brian Josephson in about 1972, um, he was a basket case. I mean, he was just less than 30 years old at the time, but he was, or maybe he was in his early 30s, and it was clear he was, he'd either just won the Nobel Prize, just been announced or whatever, but I mean, it's not a good thing to be, when everybody tells you when you're 22 and 23 that you're going to win the Nobel Prize. Okay, it sort of puts a lot of stress on you. And so you can see what happened to him. Okay, I mean, <laughs> anyway. Uh, anyway, high temperature, it's, these are wires, and this is a Josephson junction, high temperature superconductivity. These are little Josephson squids. Um, and so they're not big devices, and they are extremely sensitive. So does that answer the question about squids and why the Navy's interested in magnetic, getting non-magnetic submarines? Okay, and um, so what are the choices? There's always titanium, and in fact, I have a talk, which actually should be online, I think, about uh, titanium, my experience with titanium over the years. And this came from that. Cost is 30 times creep fatigue interaction, which someone had asked about. These are the stop, okay, red light stop. You can't do it, folks. It's too expensive. And the creep fatigue problem, the Navy came up to me in 1980 and said, how did the Soviets solve the creep fatigue problem on the Alpha Sub? I said, I don't know. Turns out three years later we found out they didn't. Okay? They built them. And they then just parked them by the side of the pier and let them work rot. Uh, fabrication, toughness, and repairability are all cautions. Uh, and then green light, high strength, lightweight, corrosion resistant, non-magnetic, okay? The other possibility, because many people have determined that they'd rather have 30 magnetic submarines that could be detected than to have one submarine made out of titanium that could still be blown out of the water, right? So, okay, so austenitic stainless steel, P-E-N-E-T, -E I think I misspelled austenitic, but anyway. The cost is only six times as much. Okay, what a deal. Okay, savings. It's heavy, so those are kind of uh, stop. Strength, fabrication, corrosion resistance are your cautions because you can't get the high strength with austenitic steels. Uh, you can get higher strength, but you can't get the kind of strengths with titanium and HY steels. Um, fabrication is gonna be somewhat of a problem, but you can do it. And then toughness, there's no problem with toughness, extremely tough, non-magnetic, um, you can repair it and you don't have problems with creep fatigue that I know of. Uh, maybe the Navy knows something. But so for the last 20 years or so, the Navy finally gave up on titanium as the Soviets did, only the Soviets built a number, number of full-size subs before they did it, before they gave up. So does that answer the question about uh, why is the Navy interested in non-magnetic subs? I mean, you can have, they built an aluminot, uh, an Alvin type of research submersible out of aluminum. It's non-magnetic, it's lightweight, just has problems with stress corrosion cracking and things like that. So 
Um, and it's also going to be just as expensive as the austenitic uh, stainless steel. But it's nice and lightweight, but doesn't have the strength and diving capability. Uh, they've tried, they've looked at composites. Um, the problem with composites is you can't repair them. You know, you, you run into a sea mountain off, uh, uh, you know, in the Western Pacific and you scrap the sub, you can't repair it. What was it, the Jacksonville, was that the San Francisco? Anyway, uh, so there's a bunch of issues. Any questions? Yeah. No. no. Faraday cage is great. Does anybody know what a Faraday cage is? Basically, if you go over here, you should take your kids over to see the lightning show over at the Science Museum. The lightning show, they have MIT's old Van de Graaff generator. And Robert Van de Graaff was a professor of physics and a professor of material science or metallurgy at MIT in the 1930s. And he came up with the Van de Graaff generator when I was a student, it was right over here where the biology building was. But somewhere along there, <coughs> they gave it to the Science Museum, and they have a lightning show. And in the lightning show, this thing's like two stories tall, two and a half stories tall. The whole thing's in a giant bird cage. So the Van de Graaff generator with its big round things at the top, there's two of them actually, so that you can have the lightning go between these two big round spheres. Uh, but the whole thing's in a great big steel lattice work, looks like a two and a half story tall bird cage. That's a Faraday cage, according to Maxwell's equations and Michael Faraday's principles. The electric field cannot get in or out of that shielded zone. We build Faraday cages in most of the electronics on board ship. Your computer, you may or may not know it, but if you have a plastic case computer, that plastic has little metal particles in it to make a Faraday cage to cut down on the radio frequency interference. Okay? Whatever's inside won't get outside electric electrically, electrostatically, and whatever's outside won't get inside. So you can be 20 yards from a lightning storm at the Museum of Science, and you're perfectly safe inside a Faraday cage, or you're outside a Faraday cage. So a Faraday cage works fine for electrostatics, electrical energy. It does nothing for magnetic energy. It is extremely difficult to shield from magnetic fields. Magnetic fields go through all kinds of things. That's why RFIDs and things like that are good detectors if someone's going to be shoplifting or something. They try to carry that through and you can't shield it. Make your, there is something called mu metal. <coughs> the induced magnetic field, which is B, is equal to mu times the applied field. So these are vectors. You know what a vector is now again, right? I knew you knew it before, but now you really know this far into the summer, right? <coughs> the induced field is equal to the applied field times mu. The applied field in the Earth for a submarine is 0.5 gauss. The induced field makes it 50 gauss. So what's mu? It's 100. Da da, I did that for that. Okay. Um, but this is the magnetic susceptibility, or actually, it's not the magnetic, it's one minus, mu is one minus magnetic susceptibility. Anyway, the magnetization is equal to chi times h, if I remember, anyway. Anyway, you go through this, and there's different simple little formula for magnetic fields. There's something called mu metal. And mu metal is something that has extremely low permeability for magnetic field. It will concentrate the magnetic field. And you can try to shield the magnetic field by surrounding it with mu metal, like the Faraday cage surrounds you know, electrostatics. But it doesn't really work. It doesn't get you down like the Faraday cage does. So the answer is no. You never did even ask the question, but I gave you the answer. Okay, other questions? So they'd love to, but it wouldn't work. Not, not, not the levels that could be detected by a surface ship or a plane going over. Okay. 
probably could get it down below anything a, a satellite can see. But you know, well, I guess I'm sure they're worried about whether Iran will have satellites in the air. I mean, they, they worry about everything, right? In the Pentagon. But I doubt that Iran's going to be putting up the satellites with squids in them. Soviets can, though, the former Soviets. Uh, and I'm sure, I suspect now there is technology out there that they can see whatever submarines there. Okay? Which is why I believe, my personal opinion, is <coughs> I would go with steel submarines and I would go without people. Do you realize how much bigger and how much more expensive your submarine has to be if you put a person on it? Even just one person. Okay? <coughs> Same thing with aircraft. And we've learned, I actually said this back in the 25 years ago, before we had drones, but drones are the way it's gonna be in the future, because you just can't afford to build ships. Anymore. Any ship you're talking about, what? What was, uh, some ship got canceled because the price, one of you gave the talk, some ship got canceled because the price got up to six billion for the ship, probably. The, yeah, CGI, yeah. Right. And the, and the good old Seawolf got truncated down to two or something, right? Three. three of them. So, I mean, the philosophy was you build one ship that can serve all missions, as opposed to they kind of started 20 years ago thinking about the littoral battlefield, and, and now you have specialty ships, and you can have lots of them, and they all crack. Oh, no, sorry. Uh, but, uh, that, that's another problem. Um, okay. Any other questions on magnetic signatures and ships? And, I, you know, they're thinking about it, and they've spent millions and millions of dollars trying to come up with titanium or austenitic stainless steels. But these things just... When you look at the cost disadvantages, uh, you just can't do it. And in fact, now more and more, I mean, I, I served on the review committee for the Ar Army Science Lab. Sorry, I got a, a cough. And, you know, um, and they spent a day explaining to us how the Army was going to prepare so that if a nuclear weapon hit, you know, in the first world war, you know, anybody in there is vaporized. And then the next little radius, anybody there is, might still be alive, but they might as well be dead, right? Well, they were going to make those people survive, okay? And I said, excuse me? Why don't you just have a way to fly new people back in after someone does this, rather than trying to make it so the people there can survive? I mean, I mean, you know, you got electromagnetic pulse, you got neutron, you, what are the, th all the things. <coughs> and they had the whole laundry list of all the things you have to, the person has to survive when they're in the second zone where you may not die on the initial blast. And they were going to try to solve each one of these. And not, it wasn't just the people, it was the electronics. Okay, they wanted them to have weapons that still worked. Okay, after an electromagnetic pulse, excuse me? I mean, this was one of the stupidest things I ever heard. And I'm a taxpayer. Anyway, uh, still one of the stupidest things I ever heard. So I always thought it's better. I mean, I would rather have, you know, a, a fleet of, of ospreys and carriers or air bases or whatever so that you could fly the first people back in who actually were healthy and had weapons with them and stuff. Because you don't have to have much of a weapon when everyone else is you know, in the shape they're going to be in. Anyway, that's me. Okay, so there's a question about, I think the question was about fatigue of welds. And why do welds, uh, why are welds, the fatigue of welds, why is it so difficult? Well, it's difficult because they keep writing books about it. By the way, here's a book on stress concentration factors if we want to know about the comet aircraft. Okay? Whole book that talks about uh, nice little charts, book full of charts telling me the stress concentration factor. You can pass that around if you want.
But typically, a stress concentration around a comet wing or something might be a factor of five. So you design this thing so it's one-third the capability of the aluminum. But then if you put a stress concentration, you have to design it so it's one-fifteenth the stress capability of the aluminum because of the stress concentration. It's better to reduce the stress concentration. OK. Yes. Yep. And the stress concentration has to do with geometry. In fact, oh, I just happen to have a picture of this is actually a piece of plastic, which is amorphous, okay, and what they call uh, photoelastic fringe. So they just pull in tension, and they have a corner here, and you can see these, this is actually Laplace's equation in pictures. You know Laplace's equation, del squared is equal to zero? Okay, you know that now? Anyway, um, so this is, nature has solved Laplace's equation. If you, saw, you shine polarized light through certain types of plastics, they will give you a photoelastic effect, which are fringe patterns that show you where the stresses are. And so you can actually go through and calculate this. And when things are very close together, like at the corners, that's a high stress, a big stress gradient means this big stress concentration. This came out, that picture came out of, I don't know if it came out of that book. Probably came out of that book. Anyway, so if you have a stress concentration, whether it's a comet aircraft win, uh, window or whether it's a weld, this actually is not even uh, a weld. This is just a piece of plain plate and it has a fatigue strength. <coughs> <coughs> we'll just say it's around 300 um, megapascals or so. That's about 50 KSI. You put a hole in the center, and we've known this since the 1880s, a hole in a plate will increase, the, will create a stress concentration of a factor of three. Okay? So whenever they put rivet holes in here, they already have stress concentrations of a factor of three. I just had to a few weeks ago, write a report on the, an Interstate 276 goes across the Delaware River. Uh, Interstate 276, yeah, goes across the Delaware River. And a few years ago, on December 16th, someone heard a big loud bang. And a month later, someone's underneath there doing some painting. And they look up, and they got a two-inch thick web on a beam that's about... 15 inches, 16 inches tall, and the whole thing's brittle fracture. And it was at a bolted joint where they didn't need the bolts, and someone went in with a weld repair. This is in 1956 they did this. They tried to fill up the holes that weren't being used by putting weld metal in there. No, this is one of those cases where filling up what you think is a stress concentration makes things worse, okay? If you just had a round hole, you'd have a stress concentration of three. You have a lack of fusion defect in a lousy weld, you got a stress concentration of five or ten. And so this led to fatigue over time, and finally, uh, a couple years ago, uh, I cracked a beam and shut the highway down for three months. Shutting down an interstate highway for three months is not a good thing. Anyway, okay, so uh, a hole will increase the stress concentration by a factor of three and you drop your strength considerably. If you put notches, sharp notches in, whoo, you drop things way down. Okay, there's your stress concentration of 10. Okay, so stress concentrations are a problem. Turns out welds, uh, sometimes people define a weld as parent metal surrounded by defective, uh, uh, or you know, a weld is, uh, how do they say it? A weld is weld metal surrounded by good material or something, I don't know. Can't remember how they phrase it. But anyway, there's the parent plate, there's a hole, and here's the weld with fillet welds, and it just looks just like the sharp notch. And why? Because if you went in there and looked microscopically at the toe of those fillet welds, you got little notches, metallurgical notches, if nothing else. And it turns out, I don't care how strong your steel is, once you weld it, all steel drops to the lowest common denominator. You might as well make it out of 36 KSI steel rather than 100 KSI steel. In fatigue strength, welded structures 
are all equal. Lousy. Okay? Because of stress concentrators. Now, there's some things we can do to try to improve it, but they tend to be fairly expensive. But basically, um, people who don't understand this will pay the price. On the Ford Aerostar in 1985, it was, the Aerostar was brand new. They were going to try to catch up with Chrysler. came out with the caravan in the 80s, and this was to replace the family station wagon with the caravan. So Ford designed an Aerostar, took the St. Louis assembly plant, completely rebuilt it, tuned up hundreds of millions of dollars, started building the Aerostar, and they had welded the high-strength steel axles and after about six months, the axle started breaking by fatigue. Because someone thought, well, the fatigue strength will scale as the strength of the steel. And I'm using steel that's almost three times as strong, so I have three times the fatigue life. Uh-uh. Not once you weld it. It has the same strength as if you use low-strength steel. So you got no weight savings. And they had to shut the plant for about six months. It cost Ford billions of dollars because they didn't realize the problem with stress concentrations. Sometimes we call things hard spots, stress concentration hard spots, okay? This is just the saddle of the tank. You guys have lots of details like this in ships, right? Does that answer the question forever? Ask the question about welds or some. Ah, oh, well, if it's something I said in the video, you can't believe that. Uh, yeah. Uh, if you have a good uh, diffusion bond, you don't necessarily have this. This is when you have fusion weld at the corner of the fusion weld, at the toe of the weld. Might as well get another board. If you blow up the corner right here, you're going to find a notch where the liquid hits the solid. You'll see a geometric notch. It may only be two or three thousandths, okay? If it's a sixteenth of an inch, we'll call it an undercut and we'll call it a defect. But there's always two or three thousandths of an inch of undercut. And from that, metallurgically, there's a, the fusion line, and the fusion line has different structure, different properties, one side versus the other. So you have what's sometimes called a metallurgical notch. It's not a geometric notch, like we think of by putting a notch in something. But I've done the thing for you where you tear a piece of paper, right? You put a notch in it, it's a tenth of the strength. Because of the stress concentration, you have a metallurgical notch when you have a fusion weld. So it, it's not a problem with diffusion bonds or some other things. Yes. So if uh, I'm selecting parts or putting parts or something, and it's friction welded together like on a drive shaft, yep. should I always go for the part that's been ground smooth afterwards to remove that? If you want the best strength, yes. OK. I mean, one of the things you can do is polish that surface. I'll show you. I think I have a picture from one of these books that shows what happens when we, we dress the weld, we call it. But if you go to any standard, any handbook on welding, American Institute of Civil Engineers, the welding, um, um, structural welding code, ASME code, they will have a section on typical fatigue strengths for steel. This stuff came out of this book, which is Fatigue Strength of Welded Structures, which is second edition from the British Welding Institute. It's a good book. Good summary of everything known about fatigue strength up through about early 1990s. This book, which I think is early 2000s, was actually not it's published by the Welding Journal, Welding British Welding Institute. This one is 2011. This has all the latest fatigue data from the offshore structure, the oil and gas guys, and all there. If you're a Coast Guard person. All the stuff they're worried about, all the waves, you know, buffeting their jack-up rigs and things like that. So this, I didn't take a lot of, I didn't take a lot of pictures out of this because this 
you got to be a graduate student to in fatigue to understand what's going on here. This the other one is the better one, and all these things are were in <clears throat> right there. I mean, here's pictures of the books. You know, you know where I get these nice pictures of the books? Amazon. Amazon. <laughs> you just go to Amazon. Perfect size. Anyway, uh, so there are lots of details. That's just a straight bar. Fatigue strength uh, for 10 of the uh, fifth cycles, 100,000 cycles, 300 mega newtons, okay, newtons per square millimeter. 2 million cycles, 200,000, okay, that's just the sh slope of that line that we saw before. And here's other details dropping down, and this goes on for pages and pages and pages, okay. We won't go through all the well details, but you can find some well detail that's similar to whatever your designer did. And it all reduces down to plots that look like this in these standards. This is the fatigue strength for a class B well. This is different classes of welds, different amounts of kind of residual stress restraint, um, defect size. And you can see you go from 100 down to 25. You can lose four times your infinite life strength depending on the well detail. Okay, and class A would actually be a solid bar, would be up here somewhere. So you got to know what you're doing. Now, to answer your question about what can we do, uh, so they take, this is actually considered one of the worst fatigue situations. You just do a, what they call a cruciform joint, okay, it's just a cross, and you put four fillet welds in, lots of residual stress, particularly on the fourth one, okay. You can usually find where the fourth one was because the others have locked it in, okay, when you make the first three. Hammer peened, you can bring the stuff back up and you're putting in surface residual stresses on top of this, con this stress concentration, okay. So hammer peened, you've got something. Fully burr machined, you were asking about machining off the surface, getting rid of that. Yep, that's pretty good. Shot peen, you just go in and hit it with a bunch of shot, uh, steel shot, hardened steel shot usually. Plasma dressed, you come along with a little welding torch and just remelt that surface. And so you get smaller defects once you melt away the bigger defect. Still got defects, but there's disc ground or locally burr machine, you go in and you just dress that, that little edge locally. As welded, okay. So you can see the stress, con it's all stress concentration and you can do different things. But these other things are pretty pricey. I remember, <coughs> now I get to tell a story. Um, so the, uh, when I graduated from high school in Virginia Beach, uh, I took the civil service exam and I, I uh, got a good grade and they hired me at the US Post Office. And so I was, my best job ever in my entire life was a letter carrier in Virginia Beach in the summer. Uh, the first part of the summer wasn't so great. That's where I learned to get up early. I had the 2.30 in the morning shift. I had to move every piece of mail in the city of Virginia Beach from the central annex to the six satellite post offices, and they all had to be there by 6 a.m. So the letter carriers could come sort their mail and stuff. And so I was moving 40,000 pounds of mail a morning from 2.30 to 6. And then after that, I'd get a little bit of a break uh, and work till 11. But that's where I learned to get up early. Okay, but I made three dollars an hour, which was three times the way what I made the summer before, which was a buck an hour, which was a fair wage for an eighteen-year-old kid back then. And I decided, <coughs> second year, I needed to make the same amount of money to be able to afford to come to this MIT. And I I took the civil service exam, but it was during the Vietnam War, and I couldn't get the five points of veteran preference. And so I couldn't score 105 on the exam. I couldn't even score 100, I'm sure. But I could get 98, but I couldn't get 103 or whatever. Anyway, so I couldn't get the post office job. But they did like me. I had a good rating. And uh, so I got hired at the Naval Air Rework Facility in Norfolk, Virginia. And that paid a buck 92 an hour. But I still needed another buck an hour. So I took my old job in the, in the uh, um, drugstore down Atlantic Ave in Virginia Beach. And I'm saying this because I assume some of you, or you know, half of you must have spent some time in the 
Hampton Roads area. Anyway, so I had 40 hours a week at Naval Air Rework Facility, and I had 40 hours down on Atlantic Avenue in Virginia Beach, which is about 30 miles apart. That's what I did for the summer. Two 40-hour week jobs separated by 30 miles. I just traveled and worked. And I decided I would never go through that again. Um, and so I came back and I got a job during the term. And that was, okay, and that's, uh, I did, I was able to get through this place uh, financially. But, what was I, oh. So the Naval Air Rework Facility, they were, we were redoing TF-30 engines, which would be in a museum today, but these were, I don't know, for some Navy jet, but the TF-30 was the standard engine. And they needed them in Vietnam, and we were rebuilding them. And we had one all set to go, and the inlet, it was all rebuilt and everything, and on one of the inlet veins, which was titanium, they noticed a crack. The inspector found a crack. And so what are we going to do? They need this engine in Vietnam. We, to disassemble it, the whole thing actually had some, uh, some cooling passages and had some plastic goo inside or whatever. We're going to have to bake it all out, rebuild it. It's going to delay everything by weeks. And so my, my boss, who is a civil uh, service engineer and been there for... Roy, I can't remember the last name right now, but anyway, Roy said, okay, we're going to weld repair it. Uh, and welding titanium in the atmosphere with shielding gas is not the easiest thing in the world, but usually they would do it in a glove bag with pure argon and stuff, but you couldn't put the whole engine in a glove bag with a person, although the Soviets do that, uh, but they put the, the person in a space suit. Space suit. Um, so they welded it. I witnessed the weld. I was the engineering person to witness the weld. And then we had to peen it. Okay? Well, you couldn't get in there. You could barely get in there to weld it. You certainly couldn't <laughs> hit it with blast, uh, shot, <coughs> and have that foreign objects all contaminating the engine. So they decided to build a little tool that was just a little hammer peener. Okay? And they did, they took what they call an almond gauge. It's a fancy name for a strip of steel, okay, like this. And the guy would pound on it with his hammer, this air hammer, peening on it. And he would try to bear down with the same amount of force and everything. And after you peen the surface, you would measure the curvature because this thing was, you would deform the top surface, not the bottom. So it would take curvature. The measure of the curvature was the amount of peening you got. It's called an almond gauge. Not very sophisticated. So I went out and spent two days watching this guy try to develop a technique to get consistent results on the almond gauge. No consistency whatsoever. <laughs> okay? So I went in and told Roy what was going on. He said, well, do it anyway. <laughs> so now I had to go in and witness the guy peening the weld that had been done on the, on the engine. And so I came back and he said, well, did you do it the same as before? I said, sure. <laughs> you know, what, what same? Okay. I mean, okay. And uh, he says, well, then sign this. And so he hands me this DOD form. And he had already signed it, but it needed two signatures from engineering. And I, you know, I had had freshman year at MIT. I guess that made me an engineer, right? Uh, so he said, sign this. I said, well, what am I signing? He says, well, if that plane goes down, you'll be in jail within 24 hours. I said, oh, so I signed it. <laughs> so I, I learned all about uh, regs that day. Anyway, uh, so far as I know, the plane didn't go down. So anyway, at least I never went to jail for that. Um, I did go to jail later that summer. <laughs> but it was not for me. I was down at the drugstore at Virginia Beach, 11 o'clock one night, and a guy gives me a $20 bill to buy a 60-cent pack of cigarettes. That's what cigarettes cost back in 1969 or whatever. And I looked at the bill. It didn't look right. And I said, hold on just a second. And there were two, we called them summer cops. These were high school teachers that would get a summer job at the beach. One was a lieutenant and one was a sergeant in the Virginia Beach Police Force, summer cops, not regular cops. 
And I went around the counter. I, I called to them. There was no one else around. I said, uh, come here a second. I think this guy's got a counterfeit bill. The first thing the lieutenant says, I don't know anything about counterfeit money. Oh, good. Uh, and you come in, and, and the guy, I said, the guy shows him a $1 bill now. He would showed me a 20 right? He shows him one. I said, no, no, show him the 20. So he reached in his wallet. He gets the 20 out. And uh, it didn't look right to me. I'm colorblind, okay? And the green seal didn't look right colored green. And the paper was sort of washed out white. It was all wrinkled. And uh, the sergeant takes it and he rips a corner off. I said, see, you, you can't rip real paper money like that. Um, and the Good old lieutenant, I don't know anything about counterfeit money. Okay, so um, I said, well, what are you going to do? And he said, I said, well, they said, well, you have to press charges. And I'm a 19-year-old kid. I'm, I'm going to press charges. So I said, no, I'm not going to do that because uh, I didn't know if I'd get in trouble. So I took his dollar, sold him the cigarettes, gave him change. He kept his 20. And I go home at midnight when I get off, and I call up the FBI, right? Wrong. <laughs> the FBI doesn't take care of counterfeit money. That's the Secret Service folks. So they explained to me, and they gave me the number of the Secret Service. So I called the Secret Service and told them what happened. They said, where are you, where are you, going, where are you going to be tonight? I said, what do you mean? I'm going to bed. <coughs> Remember, I was walking, working 80 hours separated by 30 miles. So at 4 a.m., I get another phone call. Can you come down to the station? I said, what for? I said, we want you to see if you can identify the guy who passed you the counterfeit bill. Oh, well, it turns out they had had a 100-mile-an-hour gun chase down Virginia Beach, Atlantic Avenue, at 2 a.m. Because the Secret Service had been following this guy from Minnesota, waiting for him to pass. And they had just checked in that night about 10 o'clock. And the Secret Service had checked in the hotel across the street. And they didn't think he was going to start passing until the next morning. And he went out to get some cigarettes. And he came back, and he was checking out. He had gotten too close to being caught. And so they ended up, they, anyway, they caught him. And I went down to identify him. Couldn't identify him. But they did catch him with $37,000 of other bills in his trunk. OK, but they couldn't get him for passing. And they got the guys in Minnesota with $870,000 worth of counterfeit bills that had been printing it. So. I caught a counterfeiter. Anyway, <laughs> that was my summer of 69. Not as good as the summer of 68. The second half of the summer of 68, I'll let you go, is um, they put me on special deliveries. 35 cents to mail a special delivery letter. I got the only station wagon in the post office in Virginia Beach. They would give me like 10 letters. And anyone knows Virginia Beach at the time was the fifth largest city in the United States by area. Chesapeake was third largest. Uh, <laughs> you know, we won't get into Virginia law and, and how they took the whole county, Princess Anne County, made it a city. But they give me this $3.50 worth of postage to deliver. And I would spend over almost $25 in salary, okay? to deliver the $3.50 worth of postage all over the city of Virginia Beach. I'm driving around, take, take eight hours to deliver 10 letters around the city. <coughs> now we have uh, FedEx that does it and makes money at it. And you want to know why the post office was losing money and still is? OK, because they didn't charge what a fair rate was. OK, so do we want to, there's plenty more. Do we want to have some? Storytelling next week. I'm available every day but Wednesday. Why don't you guys decide? Because I've I've got some other things. I mean, I didn't get through. I got through those questions, but someone else gave me questions about crystal structure and magnetism and uh, hydrogen cracking versus SCC. Plus, actually, I will send, pass this out. This is principles of corrosion. I think Tony, you you wanted to know the the nine points. Of corrosion, it or okay, but it's it's it should be on Stellar now with some other stuff. That's what you get if you ask a question. You're just gonna get more stuff to read, right? I'll teach you.